Well, hello, this is Samuel. This is part two of three of a series where I am comparing Roman imperial dynasties. In this video's case, we're now going to be looking at the Constantinian dynasty. But in the previous video, we had looked at the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So if you are interested in taking a look at what I thought about them, you may do so at your leisure. I don't think it'll matter too much. Uh, which video you view first, although obviously the Julio-Claudian dynasty comes chronologically before the Constantinian dynasty. After Augustus, Constantine himself may be the most well-known Roman emperor, and perhaps one of the most famous people in the history of the West. Certainly he's remembered for his great works for Christianity, as well as being the first emperor to be baptized and to allow Christianity legality, rights under the law. The dynasty is perhaps a bit less known, however, but still very important. Constantine and Augustus, in my mind, are very similar and yet also very different, so I am endeavoring to create an adequate presentation to compare the two dynasties that they have both founded. Just like with the Julio-Claudian dynasty, I'll just give a little bit of a brief prelude or prologue as to what uh, takes place before the Constantinian dynasty takes shape. And of course, we have to start with the collapse of the Severan dynasty because right after the collapse of the Severan dynasty, we have the crisis of the third century. The Severan dynasty collapsed when the last Severan, Alexander Severus, was killed by the Praetorian Guard, I believe, under Maximinius Thrax or something like that, uh, which then ushered in a period where emperors would rapidly rise and fall, would not remain very long in power, and dynasties frequently changed hands. The crisis of the third century took place between 235 AD with the death of the Severan dynasty, and ended in 284 with the rise of Diocletian. Now Diocletian comes in, he says, you know, that's enough of the crisis, we're, we're bringing back stability, and he does bring back a bit of long-term stability. But as we'll see, it's maybe not as long-term as people had hoped. And in order to deal with what had happened, this crisis that had spiraled out of control, he decided that, you know what, the empire is too big for just one competent person to manage. We need to have more than one competent person. In fact, we need to have four. This is the Tetrarchy. One empire, four emperors. Two senior Augusti. Isn't Augusti such a lovely thing? And two junior Caesari. Again, a lovely word. More emperors means more work done, and no need for one emperor to micromanage everything, as every other emperor beforehand had done, for the most part. Diocletian, Maximinian, Galerius, and Constantius were the first tetrarchs. And after a good period of time, about, I think, 10 to 16 years, Diocletian and Maximian, Diocletian especially after his very terrible illness, decides, hey, that's it, we're going to step down, right, Maximinian, because Maximinian, you're stepping down too. And Galerius and Constantius are raised to the rank of Augustus, and this is where things start to kind of fall apart. Because unbeknownst to Diocletian, the system that he had set up had had a weakness that he had not understood, which is that you need to have a leader amongst the two senior Augusti. If you don't have somebody that's clearly in charge, well, who's in charge? You can't have two equal people, and things go normally. And so things begin to spin out quite out of control. Rival claimants to power shows up, after Constantius' death, his son is hailed as Augustus. He's very popular and very capable. And Maximian, Maximian's son also, Maxentius. So this four emperors, one empire, isn't really working out all that well. Enter Flavius Valerius Constantinus, or as we know him today, Constantine. He was hailed Augustus in 306 AD in Britannia at the age of 34, just a year older than our dear old friend Augustus, and a year older than also Alexander the Great at his height and death. Constantine's fate was decided mostly at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. People often describe this as one of the most important and seminal moments in the history of the West, and this would eventually lead to his laying claim of being the sole Western Augustus, which he was. He had killed the other guy who had said he was the Western Augustus. The Edict of Milan in 313 made Christianity legal, which was a huge turn from the Christian persecutions which had been done under Diocletian and were continuing to be done under Galerius. The Tetrarch Civil War thing would kind of last from 306 AD to 324, which is quite a prolonged period of time. But 
eventually it would come to an end. Constantine would defeat his eastern aggressor, which I guess is very similar to what happened with Augustus and Mark Antony. But anyways, he did defeat Licinius, I believe, at the Battle of Adrianople, and that was it. We now have, once again, one sole Augustus. Now, instead of going to Rome and making that his capital, he decided we need a new capital in a very defensive area that's able to get everywhere as fast as possible. This is now the city of Istanbul, but originally it was Constantinople. He had rebuilt Byzantium as a city that would last basically for a millennia until 1453, and Constantinople would now be the new capital of the empire. As well as bringing a new capital, he also brought stability back to the empire. He reformed the military hierarchy, and this would last very much until, and shaped very much of, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. On his deathbed in 337, he was baptized, which makes him the first uh, baptized, so Christian, Roman emperor. This is where a lot of people start to complain about the mixing of throne and altar, but, I mean, it depends how you want to complain about that. This is kind of where the ideas of Christendom start to begin. And this indeed does pave the way for the total Christianization of the empire completely. The best way to sum up Constantine is one emperor, one empire, one god. So who were Constantine's successors? Well, they were these individuals on the left here, these first three individuals. They're all brothers, and they're all, interestingly enough, named from derivatives of Constantine. First and foremost on the left here, we have Constantine II. He ruled from 337 AD to 340 AD. He was the emperor at age 21, and he was the eldest of his three brothers. However, he was not long for this world as he came into conflict with his younger brother Constans almost immediately about territory and was killed. Yep, that's it. Not very impressive and quite anticlimactic. Going now to the younger of the three brothers, we have Constance, who is the third on, the, well, he's the third person there. He's next to his brother and nephew, uh, cousin. Constance ruled from 337 AD to 350 AD. He was the emperor at the age of 17, and he was the youngest of the three. He was an able emperor, but became disliked by the people and by the army for specific reasons that you can look up on your own. It's quite exotic. And he was murdered in a city named after his grandmother, Helena. There was some sort of prophecy that he would die in his grandmother's arms, and I suppose metaphorically he did. He was also a supporter of Nicene Christianity, which is, from Christian history perspective, quite important. And then, of course, in the middle of the three brothers, we have Constantius II. He ruled from 337 AD to 361 AD. He was the longest reigning of these three brothers. He was the emperor at 20. He was the middle child. He was also a semi-Aryan, and he ended up banishing St. Athanasius a few times, which is not super cool, but eventually things had to get sorted out, and they were. After the death of his brother Constance, he kind of had to retake the Western Empire from usurpers, and eventually he did become the sole emperor once again in 350. So it takes Constantine to Constantius II, two successive, well, successive sole emperors. At that point, he appointed his last remaining male relative alive, his cousin Julian as the Western Caesar, and of course we see Julian here on the far right. He was capable, so Constantius himself was a capable emperor, and he maintained the stability of the empire amidst threats from Germania and Sassanid Persia. He reigned for 24 years before dying of natural causes, which of course leads us to Julian. He ruled as Caesar from 355 to 360, and as Augustus, he reigned from 361 to 363. He was Caesar at age 25 and Augustus at 30. He was raised a Christian, but grew to reject it and adopted a sort of LARPy paganism, as, as much as I can say, you know, it's not uh, super cool. But basically, he tried to make paganized Christianity, is that correct? Christianized, Christianized paganism, kind of. Uh, sort of in the Neo Helio Sol Invictus type of way, but different. Um, so basically, he was just a LARPer uh, in terms of religion. Uh, but for this action, for these actions, he was named Julian the Apostate by the Christians. 
He was very well educated, however, and both in intellect and in military capabilities, he was quite formidable. He tried to return the position of the emperor from Dominus, the Dominate, to something more of the Princep version. He idolized the Nerva Antonine dynasty Marcus Aurelius, specifically as the keystone and capstone of the Nerva Antonine dynasty. However, he was killed in battle with no successor, and he was the last direct male heir of Constantine. So, what do you call that? I call that dynasty finished. Now that we're looking at this semi-anachronistic photo of Constantinople during Constantine's time, because as you can see, the Hagia Sophia would not be there because it was built by Justinian. Anyways, let's talk about the good and bad of the Constantinian dynasty. So let's start with the good. What's the first thing on my list? Well, the first thing is stability. The Constantinian dynasty brought back stability from a residual chaos of the Tetrarchy, and it kind of settled that down for a little bit. The disunity of the empires we had seen uh, had not been good, and definitely needed Constantine to fix it. And for the most part, the the unity of the empire was brought back, and stability did reign. The legalization of Christianity is probably the biggest good that I, we can say about the Constantinian dynasty, although it gets a little bit shaky in some places. I mean, we saw Constantius II as a semi-Aryan. Uh, but Christianity had been consistently gaining in popularity and in force during the previous 300 years. Persecuting the Christians was a needless exercise and a waste of time when those energies could have been better directed outwardly towards Rome's enemies. The third thing that I would say is good is the founding of Constantinople. As a choice for a new capital, it was perfectly located, and I mean, we see this in history. It's extremely defensible position and was made even more defensible in the future. Building a city from the ground up and planning things out make for a, you know, quote-unquote better designed city than those that kind of randomly, you know, throw together a hodgepodge like Rome. It had great strategic importance and would remain a very strategically important position basically until the present, but it definitely came to a... Uh, you know, ahead in 1453 when it finally was lost. And then the last good that I would say here, the fourth one, is the military reforms. As noted, and this is kind of just a little note here, but uh, if you listen to the History of Rome podcast, which I highly recommend, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out which military reforms are Diocletians and which are Constantines based on the historical record, but let's call them Constantines. Constantine's military reforms would more or less last at least in the Western Empire, until the very end. And they did play a very key role in how the Western Empire played out, specifically with the position of Mat Magister Militum, who was basically like the military dictator and the second in command of the military only to the emperor. So a very important position that would play a very key and strategic role going forward. Now, let's talk about some of the bad stuff here. When I had been first introduced to Constantine in history class, this was one of the things that I did not know, and I was very surprised to find out. And I was actually kind of shocked to find this out, because Constantine is paraded as such a great figure. But as it turns out, the Constantinian dynasty had a lot of family woes, which is kind of the first thing that I want to point out here. They, they had a habit of, like, killing their own direct relatives, which is kind of weird for a dynasty. It's not super weird, but it's definitely kind of one of the things where it makes you think, are they interested in their own self-preservation, or, like, what are they doing? Immediately after uh, Constantine died, there was something called the Massacre of the Princes, which kind of took place under Constantius II, where he had all of his male relatives that were not his immediate brothers kind of killed, except for a couple. I think uh, Gallus and... Uh, the previously mentioned Julian were kind of the only guys that were spared. Um, and I think maybe one, one other, but I can't remember his name now, unfortunately. And then, of course, Constantine also killing his own son from his first wife, uh, Crispus, who from all accounts, Crispus was basically like Constantine 2.0. Like if Constantine had died and Crispus had taken over, there would be basically no discernible difference. They were essentially the same person, had all the same skills, and it's just a total loss that Constantine ended up killing his heir, and who would have done a great job. And of course, by the time Julian died, there were no males left, because they had been either killed off by each other or usurpers. So within two generations, essentially, Const the Constantinians were wiped out. You go from Constantius Chloris to Constantine, 
Constantine the second to Julian, that's it. You have maybe three generations, and you're done. There was definitely something lacking in terms of preservation. They, they did indeed preserve the empire, but they did not preserve themselves, and we have to wonder how that has impacted the rest of Roman history. Now, the second bad thing that I would say is, I call it, divide and be conquered. The reason the Tetrarchy had spun out of control was, along with many other factors, due to it being unclear who really ruled, and with that being without having a senior emperor. So when we see Constantine going and appointing his three sons to head three different parts of the empire, we kind of have to scratch our heads and say, wait a minute, didn't this just cause a whole bunch of civil war? And it really have to pause and think about that for a second, because it just doesn't really make sense. Now, of course, with family, you know, family ties or whatever, you can say, well, he's, you know, trying to spread it out. But just from a strategic standpoint, having lived through and thought through what he did, you have to wonder why did he put in the same system again without any failsafe? It's kind of maddening. I believe this is the third point that I'd like to make, but it is Western alienation. Const uh, Constantinople, despite being bet between both continents, Asia and Europe, it's kind of it's in the east. You kind of have to give it up that it is in the east, and that by removing the emperor from the west, they were kind of hanging around, you know, Mediolanum, Milan, you know, around up in northern Italy to try to get around everywhere. When you move the emperor to the east, he can't directly oversee kind of the two two hot spots of the empire, Germania and Britannia, and these are you know two very big hot spots. And indeed, you know, moving the capital to Constantinople. You know, 80 years later, we see not only the Romans leaving Britannia, but we also see the sack of Rome. So you kind of have to wonder how much does it take, or how much influence can be ascribed to the capital being moved to where Byzantium used to be now, Constantinople, from the west. And as we do see, of course, the Western Empire does fall first. There's just a lot of instability there that, that an emperor really needed to be there for and wasn't. And then this is the last thing. This is probably a bit of a blindsider because I haven't mentioned it before, but over the 300 years or so, the wealthy senatorial class had been consistently getting more and more irrelevant. And of course, if you're becoming more and more irrelevant, you probably think, well, to heck with it. They don't want me here. I don't want to be here either. I'm just not going to invest in the system anymore. So what ends up happening is a lot of Rome's wealthiest citizens end up pulling out basically of the economy and out of society. They're not doing their part to ensure that a you know, more just society exists. You know, inflation keeps going up, the poor get poorer, and they continue to get richer. And this causes a lot of societal grief that Diocletian tries to deal with and is not very successful of at dealing with it. So that's kind of all of my points. I know more about the Julio-Claudian dynasty, so forgive me if I'm a bit biased, but this is kind of what I think with the Constantinians. Constantine himself, I think, was very capable, but he didn't really seem to see the big picture. And I don't want to do too much comparing between the two, so I'll try to keep this a little bit brief, because I think after this we'll transition into the third video. Constantine was very, very personally skilled at doing what he did. And certainly no other person but Constantine could have dragged the empire back together like Constantine did. However, it does not seem that he had the foresight to figure out how to have the empire preserved after his death. He had produced a world in which Constantine needed to be alive in order to run it, and when Constantine was not alive, things kind of started to slip off the rails. The Constantinian dynasty is kind of one of those last steps before the ocean kind of takes over the path. They're kind of one of the last great Roman imperial dynasties, and I think it is a shame that, of course, the empire kind of does start to go into a hell in a handbasket afterwards. But I think without getting too much into that, I would have to say that they are, they're okay. The Constantinian dynasty was okay. They did their job. It could have been better, but it wasn't. And so now we'll, well, I'll say thank you very much for listening to this video, and I will see you in the next video where we compare them and see who comes out on top.